Mike McGarry covers high school sports for the press and others as well uh, as the Phillies. And uh, the MLB draft was yesterday. Mickey Moniak is the newest Philly. And Jason Groom, another uh, name that many of you probably familiar with. Uh, the press's coverage has been great on Groom. And Mike had an interesting story, a little twist and turn to Groom's uh, career here, Mike. And uh, you wonder uh, why that decision was made and how that affected him uh, yesterday. Well, I think, um, you know, in, in the days leading up to the draft, as you said, he kind of decommitted from Vanderbilt and committed to uh, Chipola Junior College. And by going to a junior college, he if he were to go to that junior college, he can re-enter the draft next year. It gives him a little bit more leverage. He would have had to wait three years to re-enter the draft if he, uh, if he had gone to Vanderbilt. But I think, you know, in the end, you know, uh, it kind of worked out for him. It's not bad when you're the 12th pick in the draft and you go to your favorite team. I know it might seem like to some people the world was ending because he was projected to be one, two, or three, but 12 in the, uh, the 12th player selected and going to the team that you grew up rooting for is an outcome a lot of people would sign for, you know, uh, when they start their baseball careers. Yeah, do you think, though, you know, why you don't see this more often? You know, because people always wonder, okay, do I go to Division One? Do I go to Division uh, Three, or should I go to a junior college? Why more kids don't go that junior college route if they only want to go to school for like a year? Right, you know, you do see it a little bit, you know, and it, and it does give you that option, you know, of going back and going back into that draft. I mean, uh, Chipola is a major uh, junior college baseball power. Uh, Russell Martin, longtime major league catcher, Dodgers, Yankees, Pirates played there. Jose Batista uh, of the Toronto Blue Jays played there. So uh, obviously, you know, it, it is negotiating because you know uh, these baseball players, you know, they get their big signing bonus and then they, you know, they actually have to wait you know what does it take three four maybe five years to get to the major leagues and and then you're you know you're playing for the quote-unquote major league minimum which is a half a million dollars but is uh still you know you don't get your big money to your six or seven years into your major league career so i mean that's why so much i think is made of this signing bonus this is really an opportunity for a player to get some money to kind of set themselves up for life and and the next big payday could be you know a decade away uh mike mcgarry covers high school sports and other sports for the press of atlantic city but uh mike you've seen groom a couple times and uh so many people have you know said look you just you don't draft high school pitchers that high in the draft it's uh and you've seen a lot of high school pitchers a lot of guys who have been uh division one players when you watch him, do you see something that separates him from a lot of other guys that you've seen over the years? Well, absolutely. What I see, first of all, you know, a lot of guys throw hard, but two things sort of stand out with Jason Groom. One is how easy he throws. His delivery is so smooth, and the ball just explodes out of his hand. You know, you see a lot of other high school pitchers throwing 90 miles an hour, and they look like they're throwing 90 miles an hour. They look like they have a bit of a violent delivery. They're kind of muscling the ball up to the plate. Groom looks like he's throwing batting practice, and the ball comes out of his hands at 92, 93, 94, even 95 miles per hour. And the second thing, you know, you see about him, and it happened in every start I saw of him, the, the curveball is just unbelievable for a high school kid. And the first time he threw it in every start that I saw, you know, the crowd just kind of gasped because that's how good a curveball is. And, and he can throw it for strikes. And he also has a changeup that he's working on and developing. So, um, you know, that is, uh, you know, it's rare to see a high school pitcher with those three types of pitches. Mike, uh, the Phillies drafted a high school kid, Mickey Moniak. Now, I don't expect you to give me the full scouting report on him, but really what I'm interested to pick your brain on is you watch high school kids all the time. You probably see some great, great, great hitters in this area. This area has had a ton of talent over the last, you know, six, seven, eight years. How a team decides this high school kid here who's hitting 476. There's probably high school kids hitting 476. Every, all every, over every street corner, right? right? All over the country. Right. What separates that kid that he stands out over? I don't know who's the a kid in this area that probably who was the who had the highest average in this area uh, this year and say this kid in California is significantly better than this guy playing at Ocean City High School who's hitting four fifty eight. 
Right, exactly. I, I mean, I, a couple of things. I think a lot of these players get around now to these summer showcase events, these perfect game stuff. So they actually, you actually get to see them play against their peers. It's not unusual anymore for a kid from New Jersey to play against a kid from California or a kid from California to hit against a pitcher from New Jersey. So you have a little bit of a better reference, too. But I think what you hit upon there is the thing with baseball. First of all, the game is getting younger. You look at baseball now, uh, the days of, and, and you see it now, the White Sox releasing, you know, a 36-year-old Jimmy Rollins uh, today. You know, we've all seen the, the, the travails of uh, a 36-year-old Ryan Howard this season for the Phillies. The days of baseball uh, where 35, 36, and 37-year-old guys are hitting 40 home runs are over. Uh, you know, you can call that, you know, um, you know, the PED, the more uh, drug testing, everything else. The game is getting younger. The emphasis is on younger, more athletic players. And the thing with high school baseball players is it's high risk, high reward. Like you said, how can you possibly tell or project what a 17-year-old kid is going to be in four or five years? But if you get it right, He's in the majors at the age of 20, 21, and you have him in his prime for the next decade rather than picking a college player who might get to the majors when he's 23, 24, and, you know, you only have him for, what, you know, six years until he's 30, 31. So that's the deal with high school baseball players. High risk, high reward. Now, you watched Mike Trout play. Do you Have you seen anyone where you say that guy in this area – could make it to to the next level that just doesn't get the looks, that doesn't get that chance because of whatever. Have you seen guys recently that you say, man, this guy's unbelievably talented. Why is no one picking up on him? I, I, I you know that to me the it's like the needle in the haystack trying to find baseball players. Yet there's so much talent out there. That's got to be one of the hardest jobs is scouting for baseball players. Right. Well, I think it is, and, and you you hit on something right there. You know, uh, Tom Zerin North uh, scored uh, four, uh, seven runs off Jason Groom. Uh, a kid for Tom Zerin North, you know, took one of turned on one of his ninety mile an hour fastballs and lined it out of the ballpark for a home run. Why, if Jason Groom's the twelfth best uh, player in America, why wasn't that kid drafted <laughs> last night? You know, the, that that sort of thing. I, I think the common theme that you see a lot. Is, is speed. They say you can't teach speed. I and mean, even if you look at the players from our area that are kind of playing in the major leagues, what the, the thing that stood out about me when I saw Mike Trout play in high school and still in the major leagues when you see him play is just how fast he is. You know, I used to tell people all the time, you know, Trout would hit a ball in the gap. You're used to watching baseball. You put that down as a double. You know, you look back to the infield, and he's standing on third base with a triple. You look at Matt Caesar, lower Kate May, who played for the Cubs. What does he have also? Speed. So I think when you look at a lot of you look at that high school player that's batting 425 and, you know, can can uh, is having a great high school season, he might not just have that speed, that 60, uh, you know, that 60 time that baseball uses to sort of uh, see if he can get to the next level. So I think that's what really, you know, kind of cuts the wheat from the shaft is the speed of these players. Uh, Mike McGarry from the Press of Atlantic City. Are there any kids that just finished up that you think uh, could hear their name called throughout the rest of this draft? Well, I think, you know, I think Sean Mooney of Ocean City, uh, you know, if you're talking strictly Cape Atlantic League, I think, you know, he's been in contact with a few teams. A few teams have come down to see him. He's a pitcher who's had a tremendous year. He's got a, you know, possibly big weekend. If he were to get drafted, I would suspect it would be in tomorrow in the later rounds. He's committed to St. John's. He's, he, you know, he's statistically, there's nobody in the state who's been better than Sean Mooney, and he's pitching for Ocean City against Northern Highlands in the state title game tomorrow. He's got a 0.0 ERA. I think I looked at his stats today. He's allowed 10 hits and, and walked 11 batters in 50-something innings. Uh, you know, he, he's a guy right there that, you know, uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find a better pitcher in the state of New Jersey who's had a better year than Sean Mooney. I think he's a guy that you can look at being drafted. And the other guy from the uh, you know the other side of South Jersey, obviously Tyler Mondo of Gloucester Catholic, who went up against Groom in that big game up at Campbell's Field. You know, throws the ball 92, 93 miles an hour. 
you know, good right-handed pitcher, committed to Florida State. He's a guy, you know, that could hear his name today or tomorrow. All right, Mike, you mentioned Mooney, Ocean City. They'll play tomorrow at 2, uh, looking for their first state championship. And this team and this pro- or, uh, program has been on a tremendous ride over the net last, you know, 8 to 10 years or so. Uh, but no, uh, they have no wins in this game. Could that change tomorrow? Yeah, I think it could. I mean, obviously, you're throwing the, the like we talked about, Mooney going out there. And, they, and it's an Ocean City team that when you looked at it at the beginning of the season, you were just impressed with their depth. Not only do they have Mooney, but they've got Josh Arnold, another good pitcher at outfield. Dom Fiorentino and outfielders had a tremendous season. Nick Artemowitz at, at first base has kind of hit some big home runs for them this season. And you're right, it's an Ocean City team that's playing well. They, you know, they got off to a little bit of a slow start. You know, they didn't make the Diamond Classic, which is for the, uh, you know, the top 16 teams in South Jersey. But ever since they didn't get that invitation, you know, they've been playing tremendous ball. They won 14 out of the last 15. Like you said, they're a team that's been on a roll the past couple of years. It's their first trip back to the state finals since 2010 when they lost to Cranford. And they're facing, you know, the only thing to worry about with them is they're facing a Cinderella team, a Northern Highland team that began the playoffs as the number eight seed in their section, kind of on a little bit of a magic run for that Bergen County school, and uh, Bergen County school is also seeking its first state title. All right, uh, at 11 o'clock tomorrow, St. Augustine, kind of a uh, Cinderella story themselves. Usually when you hear about the Hermits, it's not as an underdog, but not a lot of people thought they'd be playing tomorrow. Yeah, I don't know if, you know, they're one of those teams that, you know, can you ever say they're an underdog, but this is one of those, this may be it. I mean, when you look at past St. Augustine teams, they won a state title in 2011. They had Ed Charlton, who was South Jersey Player of the Year, and went on to play, you know, at NJIT and is now a pro player. They don't really have a guy like that on this roster. You know, they've uh, improbable playoff wins over Christian Brothers Academy and Gloucester Catholic, and now they've got to beat one more power. They've got to beat Seton Hall Prep, which is a perennial power from North Jersey, and they'll turn to, to Chris Morgan, like a guy who's been their ace all season, who's 6-0 and and really stepped up for a team. And don't forget, this is St. Augustine team. You know, that started the year, they had Mike Vistoria, who was going to Maryland, and Bill Chilari, who was going to Duke. Well, Vistoria had arm surgery before the season started, has missed the whole year. Chilari missed most of the year with elbow uh, soreness, came back for the playoffs, and they turned to uh, Chris Morgan, like a kid from Estelle Manor, who has really stepped up and played tremendous for him all season. All right, uh, Mike, I'm sure we'll be there tomorrow. We'll have full coverage uh, at the Press of Atlantic City here and uh, on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. Good stuff, Mike. I'll see you up there tomorrow. All right, thanks a lot, Mike. Anytime.